الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيمة قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إنما الخمر والميسر إنما الخمر والميسر والأنصاب والأزلام رجس من عمل الشيطان فاجتنبوه لعلكم تفلحون So when you're gathering with a remembrance upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad (laughs) 
as a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibi Qulubina Rasulullah and his honorable and purified progeny recite the second salawat. For Allah to shower onto this gathering with his infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of Mawlana wa Sayyidina Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voice. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Marijuana, cannabis, or pot, has been the hottest topic discussed by all sorts of people within the past year. Whether, whether it is lawmakers discussing the legalization or the banning of marijuana or the joy and the rejubilation of potheads around the world celebrating a new era in the history of smoking weed or the concern of parents that find their teen child easily be able to access and smoke marijuana, this topic has become the most oftenly repeated subject in all headlines whether it's news agencies, whether it is social media, or the popular magazines. In the past year, all we've been hearing about is the legalization of marijuana. And of course, since this market, the cannabis industry, as the fastest growing industry around the world, giving undeniable financial returns, it is somewhere where people want to invest their money. And that is why I find this topic to be extremely important. For it is the concern of our Muslim community living in the West. You would not believe the volume of questions, the concerns, and the emails that I get, whether it is my website or social media, people asking a simple question. Say it. Can I smoke weed? Is smoking weed halal? Is smoking weed haram? I have anxiety. Can I smoke medical marijuana? I have depression. Can I smoke pot? Or the concern of parents that are afraid. The parents that are scared and stressed. That email me four page essays on daily basis. About how their children come back home with red eyes attacking the refrigerator with munchies. Sometimes they end up finding my email, my Twitter, my Instagram and sending all their messages all at once and expecting a miracle, literally expecting a miracle. Say it, I want a miracle, I'm so stressed, I cannot sleep the night. Sometimes they're so stressed that I feel like telling them, listen, you need to sit there, roll a blunt, or pack a bowl yourself. I'm joking. But indeed, it has become the topic that has been discussed by all sorts of people. And it is something that concerns the Muslim community living in the West. And that is why I have decided to address the following question tonight. What is the Islamic stance towards marijuana? And I'm going to discuss this topic through the following points. Number one, 
How serious is the issue of marijuana? Number two, why should such a topic be addressed from the member of Imam al Hussein and on such holy nights? Number three, the big question Are we allowed to smoke weed? Is smoking weed halal or is it haram? Number four, the pothead's life, the pothead lifestyle. Number five, has this issue been addressed by the Holy Quran? And how can we relate to verses that are discussed within the Holy Quran in our lives today? And number six, finally, how should we spend the most precious days and years of our lives? Let us examine those six points after your three loud salawats ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Take the echo. I'm going to share with you, please take the echo off. I'm going to share with you some shocking numbers and polls in regards to marijuana, and I'll let you decide how serious this issue is. Studies indicate that 90% of high schoolers have tried marijuana at least once before they graduate. And I tell you, you know what that means? That means only the loners and the losers are not the one that are being offered marijuana. Everybody else is smoking marijuana. Those who have literally nobody to talk to at school are probably the ones that are not smoking. That's what those numbers mean. One eighth of high schoolers, by the time they graduate from high school, are addicted to marijuana. The marijuana industry is the fastest growing business around the world where only in the United States of America in the year 2018 they had 52 billion dollars worth of sales. 52 billion dollars only in America and in the legal marijuana industry 250,000 people are employed. It is the fastest growing business with no signs of slowing down. Almost 50% of adults in America are addicted to weed. And I don't think those numbers are much different in Australia or Europe or any part of the, of the West. And I can tell you that this audience here tonight, if not the majority of you, many of you have been introduced to pot. Or you will be introduced to it. You know, nowadays, teenagers at their very early teens are smoking weed. 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, are walking around smoking weed and this culture this this culture is growing so fast so rapidly look at Hollywood movies look at the Hollywood movies there's at least one scene that makes a reference to pot somewhere somehow look at the music videos it's all about weed it's all about smoking it's all about drugs look at the Social media. Look at the magazines. If you pick up a popular magazine, there's at least one or two articles talking about how weed is the most natural thing ever. Look at the analysts talking about marijuana. They make you feel like, look, if you're not smoking weed, then there's definitely something wrong with you. 
Because wheat is just very natural. There's nothing wrong with it. This is not something we can escape. This is not something we can ignore. This is not a topic that, look, say that this topic does not belong to us. It doesn't belong to our community. It doesn't belong to the member of Imam al-Hussein. It does not belong to the nights and the days of Muharram al-Haram. We should not pollute the member and the majlis of Imam Hussein with such rubbish. Why? Let's talk about salah. Let's talk about siyam. Let's talk about hajj. If people are praying, if people are fasting, if people are going to hajj, obviously they're not going to be smoking weed. Hmm. I tell you, if people can take their weed with them to hajj, they will. And sometimes some people tell me, say, why are you talking about controversial topics? You just, you know, there's no need for it. Just a couple of days ago, somebody told me that. Says, you know, why all those controversies? Look at those lecturers. Some lecturers, they lecture for 20 years, 30 years. They don't talk about controversial things. Let's, let's just leave those controversial topics aside. And you know what I told him? I said, brother. You should have definitely been there in the time of Imam Ali. In the time of Imam Hussein. I said, why? I said, because they definitely needed this advice. Everything Imam Ali said was controversial. Look at his sermons in Nahj al Balagha. Do you think he was looking to please the people? Do you think he was looking to please the crowds? Do you think he was looking to please the government of his time? Do you think he was looking to please the rich and the famous? No. Imam Ali, salawatullahi wa salamuhu realized that his community is in dire need of certain lessons and teachings and principles and ethical and moral standards. Therefore, he spoke about them. He was not shying away from controversial topics. He said and did what pleased Allah, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's it. And once he was described, they say, Amir al muminin he was so compassionate. He was so merciful. He was so kind. He was so forgiving. But when it came to Allah, when, he, when it came to topics concerning God and the religion of God and the obedience of God, لا تأخذه في الله لومة لائم he would say and do that which pleases Allah. That's it. I say you should have been there in the time of Imam Hussein because he was the most controversial man of his time. Nobody dared to stand for y to, to Yazid. Nobody dared to stand up to Yazid. Nobody dared to stand up to Bani Umayyah. Nobody dared to give the sermons that Imam Hussein gave, whether it was in Medina, whether it was in Mecca, or whether it was during his journey to Karbala and criticize the unjustness at the time of Yazid and his father, Muawiyah. Or you should have been there to give this advice to Zain al-Abideen when he stood and he gave his sermon in the midst of the enemies that had just killed and murdered every single one of his family members. Or a Sayyid Zainab salawatullahi alayha. Or the companions of Amir al muminin Maytham al Tamar. How was Maytham killed? How was Maytham killed? Maytham was killed because he was crucified on, on a palm tree. Why? Because he kept speaking the truth. He kept saying what was controversial. So they crucified him on a palm tree. How was Abu Dhar killed? Abu Dhar was exiled. Beaten until death. Ammar, same thing. Miqdad, same thing. Khumail, same thing. Literally every one of the companions of Amir al muminin So, you should have been there to tell those guys, don't be so controversial. Look, the member of Imam al Hussein has a responsibility. I'll tell you one thing. You know, if you speak for 30 years and 40 years and you don't talk about anything controversial, there's a problem. If you don't talk about what's going to shake up the community and what's going to wake them up, there's something wrong. 
Because the legacy of Hussein main, means that you wake up your community. The principles of Hussein means you say that which pleases Allah. And that was the goal of Hussein. Inni lam akhruj ashra. Wala batira. Wala mufsida. Bal kharajtu li islahi ummati jaddi. Rasulillah. Likay amura bil ma'roof. To enjoy the good. Wa anha anil munkar. And to forbid the evil. If there is evil in our community, in our society, are we not going to talk about it? Are we not going to address it? Are we going to ignore it? And this is why we're losing big crowds. We're losing an entire generation. You know, sometimes I get invited to places and I go there and I'm sitting and I'm about to give the lecture and I see they're all senior citizens. Literally, they're all elders, 60 plus. And they speak every language besides English. So I wonder, was there a sign at the door that said this place serves senior citizens that speak every language besides English? You sometimes actually have to go double check if such a sign exists. Why? It's because Imam Hussein and those gatherings is no longer relevant. It's because the Quran and those gatherings is no longer relevant. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam when he was departing this life and he is the seal of messengers and he's the last messenger sent by God to humanity to guide us he said this to all Muslims inni tarikun fikum al-thaqalain kitab Allah the book of Allah وَعِتْرَتِي آلْ بَيْتِي مَا إِنْ تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَنْ تَضِلَّا بَعْدِي أَبَدًا Hold on to the book of Allah and to the Ahl al-Bayt. Now we come to the book of Allah, we find that we're reading the Qur'an, but it's not relevant to my life. We come to Amir al-Mu'mineen, to Imam Hussein, they're not relevant to our life. So you better believe we're going to lose a generation of our youth. What did Rasulullah mean when he said, إِنِّي تَارِكٌ فِيكُمُ الثَّقَلَيْنِ he meant it is your job and it is the job of the member and it is the job of the scholar and it is the job of the alim to make Hussein and Ali and Hassan and Fatima and the Holy Quran and Surah At-Tawbah and Surah Yusuf and Surah Al-Hamd and Surah relevant to the lives of people. I tell you, people are hungry for knowledge. People are hungry for change. People are hungry to be good people. Nobody's trying to be malicious by nature. People just need answers. People just need guidance. I have a responsibility on this member to address the concern of a mother who cannot sleep the night knowing that her child is high and he's driving on the freeway and he can kill himself and people with him and people around him. He may never return home. And don't tell me you haven't heard stories of youngsters out and about in the middle of the night and they never return home. Why? It's either they were high or they were drunk. I have to address the concern of my dearest younger brothers and sisters in high school and college and talk about their difficulties. Because you know sometimes, you know, well, say, you know, it's not that difficult, you just don't smoke. It's very difficult. It's very difficult not to smoke. Yeah, it's very difficult. You know, they say in the day of judgment, there is a small door in paradise and people are just going through that door without being questioned. As soon as they arrive to the mahshar, they go through that door into Jannah. So when they get in, they're not being questioned, nothing. The malaika ask them, who are you? Are you Siddiqeen? Are you Shuhada? Are you Anbiya? They say no. We are the patient ones. 
You're the patient ones. What were you patient with? They say we were patient to obey Allah. How so? When I can't wake up for Fajr prayers, it's very difficult for me. I need sabr. I need patience. When I wear the hijab and everybody's looking at me funny at school or at the college or at the gym or at the shopping mall, it needs sabr, patience. When I am hungry and the only food that there is is the Mac burger that everybody else is eating and I stay hungry, that needs sabr. So they say we were patient in the obedience of Allah. But then they say we were patient not to disobey Allah. And this is the greater patience. This is the greatest sabr. When you're patient not to disobey Allah, how so? You think it's easy when you're in high school and you're in college and they approach you and listen, man, just once. Just try it once. What's the big deal? If you don't like it, don't do it. And that sounds pretty convincing. Just attend one party. Come with us once. To keep saying no is it's difficult. And I truly admire my brothers and sisters who practice self-restraint. I admire them. I truly admire them. Whoever thinks it's easy has either no clue or didn't grow up in the West and didn't attend college or high school. And just is clueless on the temptations out there. And Allah reward Allah knows though. So Allah says, you know what? I'm going to re reward them without even asking them any questions. You know how you're going to, uh, for example, take a flight to, let's say, California. You have to go through TSA and all sorts of things. Most people don't go through TSA. They're pre-checked. They have a VIP status. Why? Because of their sabr. Because of their patience. Therefore, this topic, brothers and sisters, is one of the most important topics and indeed it needs to be addressed here. And it needs to be addressed now. Number three, the big question. Smoking weed halal or smoking weed haram? Indeed, it is haram. I don't really need to explain. But I'll tell you that it is medically proven that weed or marijuana or cannabis contains THC. THC is an intoxicant. Well, you know, see, it doesn't really, you know. Yeah. Even if it's a little bit of intoxication, by the way, some medical, some, some marijuana, some cannabis contains a lot of THC. So you end up getting really high. And sometimes, no, it contains a little bit of THC, so you don't get really high. But it doesn't matter how high you get. An intoxicant is an intoxicant. If you drink a little bit of alcohol, this much of alcohol, or you drink an entire, for example, bottle of alcohol, it's still haram. It's still an intoxicant. There's no doubts about that. But I want to talk about, obviously everybody knows that. And it's not my job to talk about it from a medical perspective. But I want to talk about the pothead lifestyle. You know, when I was actually preparing for this topic, I looked up some books and... and you would not believe the Bible of the potheads. That's the title of a book. Are you kidding me? And what is there? You know, another book, for example. The complete lifestyle to being a pothead. The complete guide to... That sounds funny, but it's really not funny. When you look back at your life 20 years from now, you're going to be crying. What is the pothead lifestyle? It's... 
being carefree, laughing at the face of every problem, not waking up on time, not sleeping on time, not eating properly, not sleeping properly, not attending to your responsibilities properly, being lazy, being a bum. That's the definition of a pothead lifestyle. Not only that, but it doesn't stop there. You think it stops there? Smoking weed is not just about, you know, smoking a joint. No. Smoking weed, it's about that lifestyle. It's about listening to their own kind of music. It's about going to their own type of gatherings. It's about parties. And when you smoke, you know, first couple of months, a year, two years down the line, then comes drinking. And after drinking come hard, hard drugs. And after drugs comes all sorts of problems. And soon enough you find yourself immersed in all sorts of sins. There is no way for you to escape them. All sorts of difficulties. And I tell you, this pothead lifestyle is the most unfortunate lifestyle. Why? Because it makes you escape reality. You don't face reality like a man. Turns you into a coward. Every time you think about your exam, well, let me pack a bowl. Every time you think about your bills and your payments and your finals, you smoke a joint. And then soon enough, oh, who cares? Yeah, whatever. You know, I can be in college for three years or ten years. It doesn't matter. Ah, they took my car away. Not a big deal. I'll use a bicycle. That's what happens. It's literally what happens. And then those people grow up. And those people grow up. And you tell them, listen, why don't you have a job? You're 30 years old. You don't have a job. You don't have your own home. You don't have your own vehicle. You're not getting married. Say, do you think it's easy to have a job in this country with all this Islamophobia? My name is Ali. People don't want to give me a job. He doesn't say that I blew away my youth instead of going to college. Instead of obtaining a job, I was smoking weed and playing Xbox every single day until the morning. I was hanging out with my friends smoking argile. No, now he blames Islamophobia. Now the problem is his name. Not the fact that he was pulled over with weed like about 50 times in the past five years. Does Allah address this in the Holy Quran? Yes. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5. Surah Al-Ma'idah, brothers and sisters, was revealed in the holy city of Medina and most scholars of tafsir believe it was the very last chapter revealed to Rasulullah in Medina. So this is not Mecca. This is not the beginning of Islam in Medina. This is all the way to the end of the life of Rasulullah in Medina. There's a community of believers that are fasting, that are praying, that are paying zakat, that are going to jihad. But Allah introduces, Allah, look, Allah talks about how it is forbidden to drink, how we should not drink and go towards salah. But here Allah talks about something else, talks about this culture that we're talking about. It's not just about smoking, it's that culture that Allah introduces in this ayah. Chapter 5, verse number 90. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal amanu. O oh, you believers, O oh, you who believe in Allah and Rasulullah and Hajj and Zakat and everything. Listen. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Innama al-khamru. Alcohol. Wal-maysiru. Wal-ansabu. Wal-azlam. Rijsun min amal al-shaytani fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihoon. 
Allah combines a bunch of things together in this ayah. It says drinking, fornication, adultery, gamble, um, the game of chance, which was like something like lottery or gambling. All together is part of the actions of shaitan, so stay away from it. Why is it that Allah puts them all together? It's because in Medina, there were homes, the rich would open up their homes and they would invite belly dancers and they would bring alcohol and they would bring gambling and they would, they would just turn their homes into nightclubs and people would go there. And you know, I tell you, not everybody was going there to drink and fornicate. Some people were there to go and watch. Some people were just there to meet their friends, socialize. Some people were probably just there to watch the belly dancers. I don't know. Allah says, look, you need to stop. You need to put this lifestyle aside. This is the lifestyle of shaitan. Why? Because it starts with you just attending. It starts with you just being there. But then slowly but surely you're pulled in. Slowly but surely you're now involved in every type of sin. And today... That's exactly the lifestyle of the potheads and marijuana and all sorts of drugs. And brothers and sisters, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this in the Holy Quran and we come across those verses, we have to contemplate on them. We have to make sure we make them relevant to our lives. Whether you're here listening to me or you're listening somewhere else or you will hear this later on in your life. If you're 15 years old, 16 years old, 20 years old, 25 years old, know that those are the most precious days and nights of your lives. Those are the most precious years of your life. If you ask anybody who's 40, 50, 60 years old, they tell you those are the golden days. Don't blow them away. Don't waste them by smoking weed and playing Xbox and hanging out with your friends. Build yourself a future. Put yourself on the ladder of success. Make sure you take life seriously. Look, your parents, they did everything they can for you to become successful, to have a good future, to make them proud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has immersed you in all sorts of blessings and ni'mah. Don't blow your life away. Don't say, well, I live in a country where if I'm 30 years old and I don't have a job, alhamdulillah, there is the welfare system. This welfare system is the biggest disease in our communities. It's made many people lazy. And I can't believe, I literally cannot believe some people are respected in our community when he's been on welfare for 20 years, 30 years. And when he gets into the masjid and Husseiniya, wallah hajji flan, and we respect him. Why do you respect this guy? Because he goes to hajj, and then he goes to Karbala, and then he goes to the Arba'een walk and he returns. So he, we respect him. But then he's on welfare, collecting from welfare, being a lazy at his house. Tell him, go work. Go learn. Go bring rizq that is halal to your family. What am I going to do? Be a taxi driver? Am I, am I going to be a gardener? Am I going to be a, a janitor? Wallah, wallah. A janitor is more beloved to Allah than a person sitting at home for 20 years collecting welfare. Because this person is collecting halal. This person is going to work to obtain rizq that is halal. Rasulullah says if a man leaves his home to bring halal rizq for his family, he's doing jihad fi sabilillah. And if he dies, he dies as a shaheed. One day they saw Imam al-Baqir working at a farm. 
So they came to him, they said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, shame on you. Look at how you're working for this dunya. Go and pray, go and read some dua. What are you doing working on the farm? Imam al-Baqir looked at them and he said, if I were to die working on my own farm, I would die as a martyr. Fi sabilillah, I am beloved to Allah. And what should I go and pray and fast so that then I would have to come and beg people like you for money? Begging is wrong. Taking money from other people is wrong. And this is the mentality that needs to be washed away from our society, especially the youth. It is haram for you to be on welfare. Welfare is for the disabled. Welfare is for the mentally challenged people who cannot work, who literally cannot do anything else. It's not for us to become lazy and go to ziyara, and that's treachery, that's lying. That's khiyana. What is this? Imam Hussein, he taught us the ziyara of Arba'een. And the majalis of Imam Hussein teach us treachery? Is that what we become? We need to wash away the culture of laziness, brothers and sisters, from our community. We need to become successful ambassadors of Islam in the West. And I invite you, brothers and sisters, my dear friends, my beloveds, tonight, join the camp of Imam al Hussein. The camp of Imam al Hussein didn't have anybody who was lazy. And you know, I am most concerned not about you folks here. I'm most concerned about those who aren't here. Those who come from broken homes. Those who are addicted to drugs. Those who are addicted to alcohol. Those who are behind bars. Those who are in bars. Those who are immersed in sin this evening. Don't tell me, well, Sayyidina, it's not my duty. My duty is just to be here myself. No. Imam al Hussein stood on the 10th of Muharram and he said, Ala hal min nasrin yansuruna? Ala hal min mu'een yu'inuna? He wasn't talking to the enemies, he was talking to you. Is there anybody to give aid to the message of Hussein, to the principles of Hussein, to the legacy of Hussein? And the message of Hussein and the legacy of Hussein is for you to take someone out of darkness, out of confusion, somebody who is lost, and deliver them into enlightenment. This is the school of Hussein. Inna al Husayna misbahul huda wa safinatul najat. Hussein is the ark of salvation. Hussein is the torch of enlightenment. Introduce people to Hussein, bring them to Hussein. And I tell you, if they come and they're not they're wearing a lousy hijab or not they're not dressed properly or they don't speak properly or they don't look properly, welcome them. Do not judge them. Don't say, Well, this person, have you seen their Facebook? Well, uh, look at him. Have you seen his Instagram? Don't do that. There is no greater sin. Then the sin of Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi, who intercepted the caravan of Hussein, who caused the misery of Aba Abdullah. As soon as he came and he felt guilty, Hur felt guilty on the eve of Ashura. He came, inshallah, we'll discuss his story. He was full of guilt. He came to Imam al Hussein. He says, Yabna Rasulullah, Halli min Tawbah. Imam al Hussein didn't say, Hur, now you've come to do Tawbah. Imam al Hussein says, Tub tab Allahu alayk. Three words. End of story. Imam al Hussein knew he was guilty. He didn't make him feel more guilty. He was ashamed. He didn't make him feel more ashamed. Go and find those people and introduce them to Imam al Hussein. Let them join the camp of Hussein. Let them join the camp of Qasim and Aliyun al Akbar and Aoun and Muhammad. Brothers, ask yourself this evening 
sisters, ask yourself this evening, do you want to be in the camp of Hussein? The camp of Hussein and the eve of Ashura has been described by everybody. And what was the camp of Yazid? It was that exact lifestyle we were talking about just now. Intoxication, drinking, alcohol, partying. Which camp do you want to be on? Don't just carry the name of Hussein. Carry Hussein here. Carry Hussein in your act. Carry Hussein in your life. tell you brothers and sisters Imam al Hussein, if you take a step towards him he will hold you by the hand just like he held Hur he will help you he will guide you he will navigate you through the darknesses he will let you escape from all those difficulties so join his camp this evening this is my invitation to you Let us go to Him with all of our existence, our souls, our minds, our hearts, and say to Him, Ya Sayyidana, Wa Mawlana, Ya Aba Abdullah, imagine yourself standing in front of the shrine of Hussein. Inna tawajjahna, wastashfa'na, wa tawassalna bika ila Allah. Those lovers of Hussein, everyone here present, MashaAllah, you're all young men and women, all of us together, let us raise our voice and take it to Karbala. Ya Sayyidana wa Maulana إنا توجهنا Brothers, sisters, raise your voice with me. واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا. This is unacceptable. I want the, the voice of Husseinis, huh? the companions of Hussein, just like they stood in front of him on the 10th of Muharram. يا وجيها عند الله one more time for those who have ill ones, for those who have asked us for special dua, for those who have special intention, special niyat. We say to him, Ya Sayyidina, Ya Aba Abdullah, take a glance at this majlis this evening. Ya Wajihan, and Allah. Tonight, usually, the arrival of Imam al Hussein to Karbala is discussed. They say, Imam al Hussein reached a land and his horse was no longer moving so he switched the horse and the second horse was not moving then he sat on a camel the camel was not moving then imam al hussein asked the people there he said Masmu ar masmu ard. what is the name of this land they said Nainawa. this land is called Nainawa. Imam al Hussein said, Does it have another name? They said, Yes, Ya Aba Abdullah. It is called Karbala. Imam al Hussein then disembarked from his horse. 
and he raised his hands to Allah and he says, أعوذ بالله من كربها وبلائها ها هنا تحط رحالنا ها هنا تقتل رجالنا ها هنا تسبى نساؤنا He says to his companions, this is where we're going to camp. Wallah, I seek refuge to you from the pain and the misery of this land. Then he looked at his companions and he says, Ha huna, here is where our men will be slain. Here is where our women will be taken as captives. They set up the camp. And then Imam al Hussein took his companions and Bani Hashim and he told every one of them exactly where they're going to face their martyrdom. And then Imam al Hussein looked at his companions, his family members, and he said to them, Whoever from you wishes to leave, you may leave. The people will come after me, and they want me. But I ask you, brothers and sisters, all those companions. All those men, when they fell martyrs on the soil of Karbala, who went to them? Who went to them? Imam al Hussein. He went to them. He held them. He cried. He buried them. But when he fell, who was there to come to him? That is why the poets tonight, they say, tonight we give our aza to Fatima to Zahra. Because when Imam al Hussein was in that last moment, they say they heard the cries of a woman right next to that ditch where Imam al Hussein fell. Bunayya Hussein qataluk, wa min shurb al ma'i zalamu manauk. بُعْدًا لِقَوْمٍ ظَلَمُونَ Yes, indeed, tonight we have to give our aza to that special lady, to his mother Fatima to Zahra. It is her aza. She stands at the aza of her son Hussein. أفاطم لو خلت الحسين مجدلا وقد مات عطشانا بشط فراتي إذا للطمت الخد فاطم عنده وأجريت دمع العين في الوجنات أفاطم أفاطم قومي يا ابنة الخير واندبي نجوم سماوات بأرض فراتي they say that Fatima Zahra, when she carried Imam al Hussein in her room, and it was her last month, she would hear this, this baby speak to her. And one day she cried so much until she passed out. So Imam Amir al Mu'mineen went and he called Rasulullah. Rasulullah came, Ya Fatima, what is it that makes you cry? She says, Ya Rasulullah, Anna al Janin yukhatibuni, yukhatibuni wa yakul, Anna al Mazloom. This child in my womb speaks to me, and he keeps saying to me, I am the Mazloom. Ya Rasulullah, will he really be Mazloom? Rasulullah cries and he says, Fatima, indeed he will be the Mazloom. The next day, again, Fatima cries so much until Rasulullah comes to her. He holds her. Bunaya Fatima, my beloved, what is it that makes you cry? 
يا رسول الله ان الجنين يخاطبني ويقول انا الشهيد I am the martyr. Ya Rasulullah, will he be a martyr? Yes, Fatima. He is going to be a martyr. The third day, Fatima Zahra cries so much until she faints. Rasulullah comes. Ya Fatima, what is it that makes you cry? She says, Ya Rasulullah, in al janin yukhatibuni wa yakul an al atshan. I am the one that will be martyred thirsty. Ya Rasulullah, will he be martyred thirsty? Rasulullah cries, Yes, Fatima, he will be martyred thirsty. So Fatima asks this question. She says, Ya Rasulullah, who's there going to be with it? Are you going to be there? No. Is his father Amir al Mu'mineen going to be there? No. Is his brother Hassan going to be there? No. Ya Rasulullah, then who's going to be crying for Hussein? And the Masa'ib of Hussein, this is the glad tidings to you, brothers and sisters. Rasulullah says, Ya Fatima, indeed Allah will create generations of mu'mineen one after another who will come and who will establish majalis of Aza and they will cry for the Masa'ib of Hussein. Let us raise our hands to dua. Asaluk Allahumma wa nad'uka wa naqsimu alayka bismika al-azim al-a'azam. Al-a'azil al-ajal al-akram. Ten times with the loudest of your voices, brothers and sisters. This is the time where the dua is going to be answered. Ten times. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, O Allah, we ask you in the name of the most beloved Muhammad Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, keep your hands up. We ask Allah like beggars and we say Ameen to this dua, so inshallah it will be accepted. O Allah, every man and woman present in this gathering with a sin, forgive our sins. O Allah, shower on to us from your forgiveness. Every man and woman present in this majlis with an illness, give us cure. O oh Allah, every mu'min and mu'mina with an illness around the world, O oh Allah, shower onto them from your cure. O oh Allah, shower onto the graves of the mu'mineen and mu'minat with your mercy and compassion. Hasten the reappearance of Mawlana, Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Honor us with the visitation of Hussein. Honor us with the shafa'a of Hussein. Accept our aza for Hussein. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa ila arwahil mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal ulama wal shuhada wa khadamat al Hussein. Nuhdi jami'an thawab surat al mubarakat al fatiha ma'as salawat.